into the frame, to recap, I'm going to focus, think of the camera moving in, on the developmental process of emerging adults, late adolescents and emerging adults, the 18 through 25 year old soldier. And we're gonna focus a little bit more on the strengths, the perceptual set. Um, we went there a little bit in our discussion, so please feel free to jump in. And um, if we wanna maybe draw some links to other periods in life, because we did go there some in our discussion. Um, I'll do that, and please jump in if you have thoughts or questions. Um, it'd be helpful for me at this point to um, touch base with you and see if there's big, open questions that we want to make sure to address. Um, does anyone want to just pipe up and say if there's really something on your mind that we want to make sure to use our hour well to address? Yes. I suspect you're going to actually do it, but, but I love I love the way that you know earlier when you talked about kind of building up for for others mm -hmm. you know, and connecting you know connecting that. So I, I suspect you're probably going to do it. So I kind of raised the question. Thank you. That was the perfect opening. <laughs> <laughs> you're deeply aligned. <laughs> um, build the ark before it rains. I want to tell you where that came from. Um, I was in Newtown, Connecticut after the massacre at Sandy Hook. And a mother um, of a boy whose best friend had been killed, um, who I encouraged to write her own book, and she has, um, saw that her son was going into the forest where he used to play with the little boy who was shot and talking to him and on his own praying. And she had raised him very deliberately. It's actually very relevant to us here, raised him deliberately with a deep, deep connection to God, with a deep connection in and through the whole family to God, prayers before meals, prayers of thanks, and prayers for help. And when the time came, he knew how to go into the woods and pray. And she sat down with me at her kitchen table and said, my son, um, she's made this public, his name is Tain, um, went, very moving, went to school with his friend's name posted on his shirt to sort of honor him, to carry him with him, and spoke of um, praying for his friend. And she looked at me over her coffee and she said, build your ark before it rains. So that's, that's very relevant, and it's relevant to the formation not just of childhood, but going through the surge, the biological surge of spiritual awakening with adolescence. When that process is supported, formation is set up that lasts the lifespan. But when that formation period is not supported, left willy-nilly, the young person goes shopping. And um, there are good teachers and there's not good teachers. And if you go to Barnes & Noble to try to get an idea, um, I noticed in a lot of the literature for young people, it's not particularly life affirming. Right? So going shopping is not a coincidence, it's a biologically, spiritually driven imperative that I seek, that I quest. The resolution of the period of spiritual formation is far better when supported. And I think you have a unique, unique and highly impactful opportunity as the chaplaincy for late adolescents and emerging adults to support them. So we'll jump in now to the science. Broad and pervasive impact, right? I deliberately have a few points now that we're in this journey together to return to, broad and pervasive impact of the formation of the spiritual core. Resilience, treatment, prevention, mental health concerns on the one hand, but decision-making, fitness, wellness, thriving, persistence on the other, the upside. Why so broad and pervasive? If you think back to the brain, very same brain, our choice and how we use it. Do we use it in what I've come to speak of as narrow achieving awareness, roll the ball and chase it in only one direction. 
tunnel vision. I've got to have it. I've got to have it, achieving awareness. Or do we learn to toggle between the execution of achieving awareness and awakened awareness or spiritual awareness? And if I can toggle between two forms of awareness, awakened awareness and achieving awareness, I have a far more powerful way of being in the world. It's more aligned, it's more flexible, and it's more life-giving, right? So that is why there are such broad and pervasive impacts, because the seat of being in perception is foundationally impacted by the spiritual core. So when we're talking about the spiritually fit soldier, right, we're talking about seizing on this surge, remember? Longitudinal twin studies, remember, say that between, from middle to late adolescence to emerging adulthood, there's a 50% increase. Let's go back to that point. As a blueprint for action, as a blueprint for intervention, that is your opening. Two-thirds environmental impact on the formation of the spiritual core, really from 15 to 25. That is your opportunity. And how you impact my formation as a young soldier will stay with me the rest of my life. I'm less likely to be addicted. I'm less likely to be depressed. I want to frame these now that we're revisiting it in the context of emerging adulthood. Why would it be that in the window of risk, the period of time when I am most likely to have first onset, the period of time where my risk for depression and addiction is much greater than in adulthood, why would it be that that's the moment where the protective benefits are even greater than they are in adults at midlife? When you look through all the mess and noise and grit of science and see that if something is 80% protective, through all the inaccuracy of measurement, the signal is that strong, it leads me to wonder if we are looking at two sides of one coin and that a lot of the pain and struggle, the unsupported quest, the existential flailing, is what we're picking up as depression, is sought, remember the tricky back door from the teen that found me in my office, the tricky back door of addiction, trying to jumpstart a sense of transcendence, trying to feel as if there were some sense of love and connection. So I invite you to consider in those young people with whom you've worked, have you seen what looks like, through the lens of a narrow medical model, depression, addiction, actually foundationally to be about spiritual struggle, the existential hunger, the emptiness, the attempt to jumpstart a sense of warmth and light? Yeah. Because certainly young people know it that way, those with whom we've interviewed, hundreds of young people. How does a young person develop the spiritual core before he or she ever comes to you? Science is quite clear here. The intergenerational transmission of spiritual life is predictive of the spiritual core in the soldier the day he or she shows up. We looked at children of depressed moms, and we found that no matter how likely I was to get depressed, no matter how likely this train was about to hit the wall, if there was an intergenerational transmission of spiritual life, I was 80% protected, even being at high risk. We then went back 20 years later, and we looked at grandparents, parents, and children in the same cohort, and what we found is when there was three generations of transmission, the effect was even stronger. I was 90% protected against depression going through the window of risk. When faith life goes hand in hand with family life, with those who love me embody, if you will, the unconditional love and acceptance of that faith which is being taught to me, there's a weave, right? A weave of unconditional parental or grandparent love and the transparency of my family onto an unconditional loving higher power. Science shows us that in the formation of the spiritual child, there is an equal contribution of parental or grandparental transparency and the embodiment 
of the parent or grandparent in my relationship as the child with them. It is in these moments, right? Not by picking up a book when I'm 20, although that could be for some, but is usually this, right? Now, I'm gonna share with you a story. I was tangling with this science. This was 20 years ago before any of this was published, and I, I was tangling with this science, and I saw that in children in poverty, children who had so many risk factors not helping them out, not helping to support their mental health, there was this very clear signal that spiritual life was helping them. But it wasn't as strong as I could see clear as day in the clinic. You know, in the clinic, it was obvious to me that children whose family had a strong spiritual life had an entirely different path of recovery. So I'm riding the subway one day, wondering, you know, up and down Broadway in New York. It was a Sunday. It was B.C., before children. And I had a little time, <laughs> haven't since. And there I was on the subway, at wondering, why is it that the signal, you know, I, I know, I can see in the clinic that children whose family was, and suddenly, you know, waiting on the platform, waiting on the platform, hot August day, a car rolls in, and I think, fabulous. I'm gonna hop on this subway car. I've waited, you know, 10 minutes. The car rolls in, and it keeps going. Next car rolls in, keeps going. Nobody's stopping. It's very hot, trying to get on the subway. Finally, the car rolls in, and I see that it's packed. I mean, packed. But there's one car where there's space, so I say, I'll hop on there. I hop in the car, and very quickly, I see why it's open. In this one car where there's space, all of the people have smashed down to one end. Because over here is a very agitated, increasingly edgy, homeless guy, gentleman, homeless man. And as each person walks in, he says, hey, will you sit with me? And they look at him and run down there. Next 86th Street, 96th Street, 103th Street, hey, will you sit with me? Finally, we get to 125th, 145th, and the door opens, and on walks to the subway, the most magnificent grandmother and her granddaughter. The little girl is in pink with white gloves. The grandmother has matching white gloves, a pillbox hat, and a beautiful green pastel dress. And they look so regal that the entire car of people cringes at the inevitable. Right? And sure enough, hey, will you sit with me? The grandmother and the granddaughter turn to each other, nod, not a word is said, and walk right over and sit with him, side by side. He's stunned. He can't believe it. Someone has seen him. Someone has sat with him. And so he turns to them and he says, hey, do you want some of my lunch? And he starts throwing his lunch. The grandmother and the granddaughter look at each other, nod, not a word is said, no thank you. And he's so stunned that we hear this three or four more times. He cannot believe that he is seen, that he is respected, that in some sense he is loved. And it dawned on me, if we were to put words to that moment, what might they be? What words come to you? What came to me was what you do to the least of these you do to me. And grandmother was living it with granddaughter, side by side. The nod didn't need words. We knew what this was. It was deeply integrated spiritual life. Religious values lived, so deeply shared, so deeply part of the f fabric of the family. That the, grandma didn't say, now go sit next to him. Right? They knew. Right? That was the intergenerational transmission of faith tradition, the intergenerational transmission of religion. That is what's 80% protective in one generation and 90% protective over three generations because it is deeply integrated into how we see and know every day. It is the seat of perception that informs all other moments, which is why we get a big, broad set of outcomes that look like this, right? It is the foundation of every waking moment, whether it's the subway or school or anywhere else. Unfortunately, those moments are becoming fewer and farther between in the United States at large. 
there's a decrease in the intergenerational transmission of faith life. There's a decrease in the intergenerational transmission of religion. And with that is hand in hand an epidemic writ large, but particularly in youth of depression and addiction and suicidality. Rate of suicidality has surpassed that of death by auto accident. It is the number, it is the most, um, is the highest frequency amongst all other forms of morbidity in adolescence. And it accounts for about eight and a half percent of adolescent deaths, of adolescent deaths. The loss of the spiritual core, the intergenerational transmission, has enormous cost on the child. It is a cultural wave that is drowning our youth, and it looks like this. Internalizing disorders, externalizing disorders, addiction. We looked at children of opiate addicts. If my mother is an opiate addict, and you drop me off at a faith community with anyone in my family who has a strong spiritual core, I become concordant, if you will. I share the spiritual bearings of the healthiest person in my family with whom I share my faith community. And if that happens, there is an intergenerational transmission, not from my opiate addicted mother, but from my cousin or my grandmother, whoever has been my spiritual parent, if you will. And I am 90% protected against picking up substances going through the window of risk, which is actually 11 or 12. So if you want to break the intergenerational transmission of addiction, of substance abuse, you welcome the child and a member of their family to join the faith community. 90% protective, 90% likely to interrupt the intergenerational transmission of addiction. The rate, I'll invite you to ponder, the rate of personal spirituality, I turn to God for guidance. My spirituality is highly important to me. In opiate addicted moms, what do you think it might be? It was 4%, 96% of moms did not feel a strong personal spiritual life. And yet in their child, it was roughly commensurate with the national rate. And if the child was concordant with a loving, constant, spiritually observant adult, that concordance protected the child 90% from picking up, which at 11 is cigarettes and alcohol. Okay, so what does that mean for you as the chaplain? You have parents who suffer, you have moms who are depressed and addicted, you have dads who are depressed, some of them very aggressive and addicted. How do you help the child and protect them from the intergenerational transmission of depression, addiction, suicide? You are the source of the greatest protective factor. You are the one who can offer renewal at the level of the family for that child and interrupt the train wreck. You know where the train is going and you can pull the lever. Now, you have an advantage. These are regions of the brain that are part of, um, let me back up. Uh, well, I'll do it this way. You have an advantage. You have young men and women who come in service, right? Service. In fact, when we have been honored to have members of the chaplaincy speak at Columbia, afterwards, many students come up and they say, you know, my brother, my brother's in the Army. And the link they draw is that they are a healer, someone of service, and their brother is a person of service. There's a natural fit, two siblings from one family, people of service. Well, it turns out that if you look at the spiritual use of the brain, the slides we've seen before, and you overlap them with altruism, altruism is a profoundly predictive factor of use of the spiritual brain, service. You could say prayer and action, right action. People who serve come to you with a strong spiritual inclination. They're choosing to serve. And 
altruism more than any other single factor, any other single thread in spiritual life was most robustly, most comprehensively mapped onto the spiritual brain, service. So that may not be surprising, but what you have to work with is extraordinary. And it may be that the motives, when we're speaking of basic training in day one, that the motives that many of the young soldiers bring are indeed spiritual altruistic motives and that they have imminently available the use of the spiritual circuitry. The choice of awakened awareness is there. It's at play. Whether or not fully verbalized or realized, it is absolutely at play in the choice for service. So let's look at the upside. Building the spiritual core, the spiritually fit soldier. What does that mean for the very well known character strengths and virtues. And as I shared with you, I have a very, very uh, deep love. I was Marty Seligman's student in the 90s when he was forming the positive psychology movement. And we would walk for hours around West Philadelphia. And usually our conversation would terminate in a cinnamon bun. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and and the, the, the one area um, in which um, my mentor, who I so respect and adore, we have never agreed, is on spirituality. And the dominant view in positive psychology traditionally, as Marty saw it, was spirituality was the nice feeling. He wrote an article for my APA journal saying this. Um, the spirituality is the nice feeling you get sort of um, secondarily to doing the right thing in life. And certainly right action can be a road to spiritual awakening, but I think there's much more to spirituality. I think the science now says we're innately spiritual beings. It allows us to perceive, um, I would say, what is for many otherwise an implicate order comes to the fore. It's a perceptual capacity. It's, it's not only a nice feeling that is secondary, it's a foundational human core. That said, how do we square this science on spirituality with the very robust and helpful work on positive psychology? So these are grit, optimism, forgiveness, character strengths and virtues which both bear instrumentality, they help us do well and succeed outwardly, and they're also inherently good values. Well, what do they look like? Let me introduce you to this next graph this way. I invite you to think of a young person, 18 through 25, who has had exceptional optimism, and now someone with commitment, and now someone with grit. How many people were you thinking of? Many people say one, and this is why. The character strengths and virtues do not scatter amongst people evenly. They load into the same people. So in this sample of 6,000 college students, these are organically derived categories, we see that the very same people the very same people who have grit, optimism, gratitude, and forgiveness, the blue folks, have it all going, right? And we love equally the red folks who are low on grit, optimism, and forgiveness. The character strengths and virtues are not best understood as singular entities that can be trained. I wouldn't want to train my son into grit and my daughter into forgiveness. Instead, the character strengths and virtues are best seen as a singular entity. Character strength of virtue. Virtue. And for 85% of people, virtue is derived on the far left from daily spiritual awareness. For blue, green, and red, I have as much virtue as I have daily spiritual awareness. I turn to God for guidance in times of difficulty. When I have a tough decision to make, I ask, what really does God want me to do? Nature is a sacred home. My family is sacred. Going through life with a spiritually open eye caught on the red brain is the seat for 85% of young people of all the character strengths and virtues. The purple folks are another story. 15% of young people, and it's more like 20% of older people, are what we might call virtuous humanists. And when you speak in more depth, they say, my ultimate meaning is not in my higher power, it's in my relationship with fellow people. 
You might call that relational spirituality, but that is how they understand their ultimate meaning. For 85% of young people, if I feel that God has a purpose for me, I have more grit. If I feel that you are God's child, I have more forgiveness. The foundational bedrock on which all the character strengths grow is my spiritual core. So if you want a positive psychology, character strength, soldier, fit and ready to go, you start with the spiritual core. And anything else you do will only add to that. Okay, this is why. This is on page 246 of The Spiritual Child. Here's the hard work which we started to speak about of adolescence. Who am I? What is my purpose? You know, is the world a good place or is the world a bad place? Um, is it evil? Is it good and evil? What are people about? Is she with me? Is she against me? Is she my sister or is she my enemy? Right? How do we think of people? Well, let's look at the hard work of late adolescence and emerging adulthood with and without the spiritual core to understand this. Why is it that for 85% of young people, the spiritual core goes hand in hand with the positive psychology, character, strengths, and virtues? Okay, who am I? I am, without the spiritual core, I'm my parts and pieces. I am the fastest one in my whole training group. I am the smartest one in my whole training group. Actually, I'm in kind of in the middle, and I'm, I'm the slowest one in my whole. I am looking at you and measuring me against measuring you, right? my parts and pieces, the world of measurement. But what about who am I and who am you as told from the spiritual core? I am, think of the picture with mom and grandma and dad and service. I am a child of God. I am made of life itself. I am a being of infinite worth. And if I am a child of God, then you are too. If I am a soul on earth, you are too. Which means our relationship is not about measuring my speed against yours or your aptitude against mine. It's about interest. It's about encouragement. On a tough day, it's about forgiveness. And at the end of the day, you have a lot better ethics, relational ethics, and teamwork when we know ourselves both as souls on earth, children of God. Now, what about my struggle for who am I? Well, if I am a child of God, if I'm a soul on earth, then what is it to be good at math or fast? Those are endowments, those are gifts, those are aptitudes through which to discern my contribution, my purpose, my calling. And the day that they don't go well, and everyone smokes me, and the day they don't go well and I fail, that's disappointing, but it's just noise on the trajectory of my calling, purpose, and path. Why does this matter? There's enormous fragility with identifying with my parts and pieces. When I was on the road with the spiritual child, I was invited to about six communities with clusters of suicide. Palo Alto, right New York, because when I identify with my performance, and that slips under me, or even if it doesn't and someone surpasses me, it will never be enough. Think about the two uses of the brain, the achieving brain, the awakened brain. In Palo Alto, there's a fence along the train track in town because if you can delay a kid three minutes from killing himself or herself, they're unlikely to do it. In Rye, New York, there was a cluster of suicides and the parents sat, as you as chaplains sit now, trying to recreate the culture. No more left this willy-nilly culture. You know, they want to redesign their culture to support the spiritual core of the child. You create your culture, right? And it's done in the relational fabric. And I see this as a parent. You know, I have um, students large, medium, and small in my house. And when large student comes out of school, all the parents cluster around large student and want to, you know, say hi. And when small student comes out, they don't even talk to small students. So there's a culture where young people are equated with their success, not with the fiber of their being. And I think we can redesign culture. I'll just do one more of these. Um, well, I, I've seen a lot go on around work, 
right? What is my purpose? What is my meaning? What is my work? If I can translate both my failures and successes, my aptitudes and my, and my deficit into a calling, I can see my unique contribution and I am outside the world of measurement. Got it? Okay. Onward? Okay. okay. We looked around the world. Remember I shared with you the Benson study done over the many countries, Thailand, Ukraine. We looked at adults. We looked in China, India, and the US. And we said, okay, if we know that the capacity through which we perceive and know spiritual life is one-third heritable, then there must be common phenotypes around the world. There must be some form of phenomenological shared experience around the world. And indeed, we identified at least five a deep sense of interconnectedness and oneness, that what happens here is intimately related to what happens on the street and what happens 100 miles away and 1,000 miles away, that as we are both distinct people, there's a common oneness. Everyone gets that. There's individual variance in every country. Every country has the same frequency and capacity to perceive oneness and distinctness, interconnectedness. Love. Love is not just a happy emotion, it's a mutative force. It's a sacred force, everyone gets that. Love is different than being nice. Love is different than happiness. Love is, love is a sacred force. A practice of transcendence, prayer, meditation, mind-body, service, altruism, as right action, prayer and action, and ethics, based on my relationship to the absolute, the higher power. I don't cherry pick my values. I, I was taught in college to cherry pick my values. I, I was. That was a um, tacit, secular materialist notion of ethics, that you weigh them out and pick what you like. The, the notion that in some way ethics are absolute and derive from our relationship to the higher power is all around the world. Now, what's interesting about these five phenotypes is that no matter where I live, India, China, or the US, to the extent that I strengthen my phenotype, two-thirds socialized, right, I am less depressed. To the extent that I strengthen my phenotype, I am less likely to attempt suicide, and I am less addicted all around the world. Not surprising. That's the constant signal we see across data sets. However, in India and in China, the more years of formal education I have, the stronger my phenotypes. Uniquely in our country, our years of mainstream formal education attenuating, they thin out my phenotypes. I am foreclosed in developing spiritual awareness, awakened awareness by mainstream education. And to that is the peril of our young people. And to that is the escalated rates of depression, addiction, and suicidality, the fragility. And that means that when I show up day one as a soldier, I am not as well built as may have been the case 25 years ago. The army did nothing wrong. Society changed under our feet. It's the same with public education. And who shows up, shows up today, far less likely to have built the spiritual core. Who shows up, shows up today, with a weakened set of phenotypes. More likely to be depressed, addicted, more at risk for suicide. Less resilient, less persistent, less forgiving, and they're not bad. They're the same beautiful person that was born 20 years ago, right, 25 years ago. They have not had spiritual support. It used to be that in the air and water, there was at least some derivative sense of religion. So as a child growing up, basically everybody at least knew or thought or prayed or did something to have some type of relationship to God or decided that they didn't, but they thought about it, right? There are young people who have never, ever had deep, meaningful discussions about the higher power, who have never been taught to pray. We see at Columbia young people who don't know what their higher self is. The beautiful visualization that was the gift from Gary Weaver that we shared today I have done with adults in banks, on subways, and I've done it with kids in homeless shelters. Everyone has gotten it. But the Columbia students couldn't figure out what their higher self was because no one had talked about the deep, deep part of yourself that's much more than anything you've done or not done, anything you have or don't have. 
So think about the column with no spiritual core. I think you probably have an advantage because of the spiritual neural correlates that go hand in hand with service. And I know that you have an advantage because you have a chaplaincy. What I wouldn't do for a big, strong chaplaincy, right, for our students at Columbia, you have great assets. Right? In fact, I would say our greatest national resource right now is you, the chaplaincy. You and you alone can support the spiritual core of young people who face a tidal wave, an absolutely drowning tidal wave otherwise, by strengthening the, the core. Okay, so um, I shared a bit about this, the very same brain choosing to tell the narrative of stress and attachment versus spirituality, right? And this is, this is essentially a habit of being. You know, if I routinely turn to God for guidance, if I choose to make the choice to take on the spiritual lens over and over and over, I use the spiritual network in the brain. Over time, I develop the red brain, right? I develop the red brain, the thickened structure and it becomes the go-to habit. When we invited people into the, excuse me, when we invited people into the lab who had recovered from depression through a deepening of spiritual life, remember this study, then showed that they had alpha, the wavelength of all life and creation. When we invited them in, we didn't say come in and pray. We said come in, close your eyes and lie down. And because they had habits of prayer and because they made a choice to live with a spiritual lead foot, that was their new normal. That was their go-to place. These are habits of being. Mm -hmm. So what is the difference between mindfulness, if we get down into the weeds a little bit? Mindfulness is a very wonderful attentional practice, right? It's a cognitive skill, and it silences rumination. Rumination is the default mode network gone crazy. Little me, little me. Um, you know, I did this wrong, I did this badly, how can I, you know, it, it's problem solving, it's, it tends to be focused on the self, and it tends to be spinning. Um, rumination was developed by Susan Nolan Hoeksema, who was also one of Marty Seligman's students, and a great mentor to me. Um, Susan's uh, work before she passed was going to be on prayer as interrupting rumination. So Susan Nolan Hoeksema, who developed the construct of rumination, I met her in a coffee shop. This was about a year before she died, and we were going to do a study together. She was very interested in how prayer interrupted rumination. Left only to cognitive devices, the cognitive devices on deck are to distract ourselves, to suppress emotion, right, or to let rumination roll. But the way out of all of those cycles, which are very sort of psychodynamic, you know, think of a pressure pump models, the reshuffling of the deck, the rearrangement of meaning, the new light in the, in, in the model is opening the door, the spiritual door. Right. So mindfulness alone cannot do that. Mindfulness is an intentional practice. It's very helpful at quieting the little me, at getting us to the front door of presence, but it is not spiritual awareness, and it doesn't have the same neural correlates or perceptual properties. Again, it could be the threshold to get there. There's nothing wrong with it, but it is, mindfulness is not spiritual awareness. Spiritual awareness benefits from three other capacities. Both mindfulness and spiritual awareness quiet the little me, quiet the default mode, stop the racket. But spiritual awareness crosses the threshold into the landscape and is able to see, feel, and know daily life in an entirely different way. To be able to see a much broader scope of data, to have information pop and be present, to feel a basic sense of love and goodness in the fabric of life, and to know that we are part of an interconnected world. Think of the phenotypes identified in India, China, and the US. Interconnectedness and love were the two chief perceptual common phenotypes. Spiritual awareness lets us see, feel, and know the very same house, very same cul-de-sac, very same family, very same job, in an entirely different way. It's that use of the brain. Now, how, if I develop awakened awareness, can I still go out there and get the job done? You know, I don't want to necessarily 
choose a life in which I isolate myself on the mountain type or, you know, or, or seclude myself. Well, it turns out that the ability to toggle between going after things in a focused and narrow way and switching over and perceiving things in a whole and awakened way, the ability to toggle between awakened and achieving awareness yields the most highly interconnected use of the brain that any study has seen except equaled by openness to experience. Right? So what you're looking at are basically the myelinated tracks between regions of the brain, the highways between regions. And this is a very, very highly interconnected brain you're looking at. It's one that can perceive things bottom up and top down. Benefit from inspiration, knowing of the heart, execute through a plan and a strategy, the knowing of the head. But it's one in which the knowing of the heart, the intimations of what's true, guide the execution. The heart guides the head versus one in which the head is added alone. Right. This is the brain on quest. This is actually a brain that benefits from a life of quest. These are structural slides. Um, and it, it uses a method that shows essentially how over time we craft our own brains. Okay. We try to support this, as I mentioned, in our students at Columbia and Barnard. We found that a great number of students are seeking spiritual support. So most of our students are already in therapy or they've done therapy and they appreciate what they got from the mainstream mental health model, but they have not resolved their pain. And they somehow sense that there's more work to do. And when we get in there with them, as we started to discuss, there's a feeling of spiritual atrophy that maybe as children or maybe at their parents' knee or maybe before coming to Columbia or before facing a trauma, they were more spiritually connected. But spiritual injury, the sense of unworthiness before God, the sense of disconnection from that felt connection and love with God is why they're coming for help. And that through a method much like the work you're doing, I shared with you Gary Weaver's counsel visualization through work like that, we help reignite their spiritual or awakened awareness and we find that indeed using standard measures of depression, symptoms of trauma, they get better. So you're our greatest national resource when it comes to fitness and readiness. Think back to our first talk, primary prevention. Every single soldier who shows up can build the spiritual core. They will have more grit, they will have more relational ethics, and when the difficulty comes, they will be more prepared to take trauma as a doorway through which to deepen and strengthen their spiritual life. They will be more, not less, with you by their side. Thank you. Discussion. <laughs> Thanks very much. Um, just to build a little bit on what you talked about this time, as well as some discussion uh, from the last, I kind of have two questions. Um, one is related to definitions of depression. Um, and how would you relate spiritual struggles, or what Ken Parkman calls spiritual struggles, with clinical depression in the sense that can we over medicalize the term? Um, and make it more pathogen-centric than, than ought to be, perhaps? Um, and is there a space for spiritual traditions, such as the Book of Job, uh, the, the Passion of Christ, uh, what John of the Cross calls the dark night of the soul, to create space for normalizing depression or spiritual an aspect of depression as spiritual struggles? Uh, that are that lead to that post-traumatic growth. So that's the first question. And then the second is just kind of related. How do we train our chaplains to be able to make people aware of this or, or to go through their own spiritual struggles? Um, in my experience, you can't necessarily give what you don't have. So how can chaplain, we help chaplains deal with their own spiritual struggles in such a way that they could help others. 
So those are kind of my two Beautiful. questions. Beautiful, thank you. Um, I'll start with number one, and I think um, you have a lot of expertise in the room to respond to number two. But we could perhaps do that in discussion. Um, with respect to number one, we looked over the life course at the relationship between depression and spiritual growth. And what we saw was that those people who by mean age 26 had a strong spiritual core right, were 90% protected against major depression um, if they were at high risk, 75% protected amongst the normal population. So again, amongst people at high risk, people under the rain cloud, people in conditions of trauma, people with genetic vulnerability, the spiritual core is even more important. It's incredibly important for everybody. It's even more important if I'm at high risk. So at mean age 26, between 26 and 38, I am 90% less likely to have major depressive disorder diagnosed as such using the structured inventory if I have a strong spiritual core. But how did I get there? at 26, and it turns out that to have gotten there and said, yes, my personal religious and spiritual life is highly important to me, I turned to God for guidance. To get there at 26, I was two and a half times more likely to have had depression between 16 and 26. The road to a strong spirituality that's protective through my adulthood is in an adolescence and emerging adulthood of struggle, dark night of the soul, and through the wondering. Two-thirds of my caseload, says the college counselor, is not clinical depression as we know it and are trained into it. It is an existential struggle. It is what I would call spiritual emergence, the booting up, the heritable surge, right? And this is radically underrepresented through the medical model. Right? And in fact, I don't even know that we should, as you suggest, use the same word depression. It would be an enormous contribution to the formation of adolescents and young adult if we in this room right now might come up with a word as simple and as parsimonious as depression that refers not to the medical models one-third of young people who have a broken piece physiologically, right, but to the two-thirds that are having developmental depression, emerging spiritual awareness, awakening. What might else we call that, right? The medical model is very good at describing the one-third, but the two-thirds are terribly misunderstood because we're using the same term that, as you suggest, could be in this room here now given another name, right? And it is related to um, formation through the fire or through you know, the tunnel or something. You know, there, there's ways that everyone in this room knows it. As a very, um, as an augmented chaplaincy reaching proactively into primary, secondary, and tertiary prevention, that's a wonderful area to look. Yeah. Part two, I, I will defer to the room. Yes. Ma'am, as, as a uh, proud and blessed grandparent of five wonderful grandkids, I was very encouraged by the intergenerational uh, analysis that you did. As a chaplain, though, especially as a former AIT chaplain, I'm curious about how effective it could be if you have less, uh, for lack of a better term, time on target, okay? Because very few of us have that much contact time with individ specific individuals, especially if you take it in a basic training or AIT context. And, uh, you know, in theory, you pass them off to an equally talented, capable, interested chaplain. Uh, but there's really not that time on target or continuity. So in any of these studies, was, was there a look at contact time as a factor and how can you enhance minimum contact time? Thank you. Um, I, I have two thoughts. Um, one is if we look at the science, um, if I am the child of someone who is um, 
debilitated by mental illness. They are, I have a mother who's so depressed that she can't function. I have parents who are so addicted they can't be present or they harm me. And you simply drop me at a faith community. I do so much better. You literally drop me, like get, get out of the car and go. And I do so much better because the relational quality, if we think back to page 246, you see me as a soul on earth. You see me for my goodness, my inherent worth. You love me. And in fact, I get to learn about life done on sacred ground. I watch confirmations. I watch weddings. I see funerals. I'm greeted by elders. My life is entirely different if I'm in a faith community. So I think that that is a context in which no matter what I've come from, I can strengthen my spiritual core. I can form relationships, relational spirituality, another way. Um, you bring that. When it comes to continuity across individuals, um, one thing we've talked about is the, the chaplaincy already um, has some very powerful ways of working that I've learned from you as you've come and, and visited us at Columbia. For instance, um, the idea that in recovery from trauma, you would surround me with a circle. I'd go back there in this time with God present and the support of you and the members of our circle. And through prayer, there's a rearrangement of meaning, a healing. Right? That is a profoundly, foundationally spiritual process. It's nowhere in mental health. And I've met a number of people in the chaplaincy who've shared working with that depth of, of, of sacred presence. So it seems to me that you already have some through lines and um, that the handoff could be, I, I guess, maybe simply like you were saying, a matter of languaging some things you already have happening. You know, what is this when we're helping two-thirds of our young people come into formation? when it is their dark night of the soul, a name that everyone shares for that. What is this when the doorway through trauma to deepening of inner life that's already being done, what's the common name for that? So it seems to me you already have ways of working that are deeply integrated. Um, and there could be half a dozen names that we all call it the same thing. And it holds its space and people understand it who may not be part of the chaplaincy. And again, it's not done by mainstream mental health. No one's on each other's toes. These are two lanes, and they're both needed. And every bit of science says you can't get by with one lane. Yeah. Good morning. Uh, I was intrigued, a couple, uh, two things. One, I was intrigued when you said if you look at Generation Now, uh, 20 years, you know, 20 years ago, 25 years ago, we were much more, I'll use the term resilient in some term or what we got from our generation, much more tied to sort of the grandparent, I'm thinking myself, where you said today's generation, the, the 18, 20 year old, you know, in college to AIT coming in uh, to the military, much less. So my one question is, and if we deal with these wonderful terms of you know Generation Y, Millennials, uh, they're so much more interconnected with the world through social media and everything uh, versus what we had um, or didn't have, and that sort of face to face. How much does that play into it? Because I'm thinking a lot of times, um, and even in just the general Jewish community, so many people may have been brought up with. Uh, it's just not interested. So I'm curious to that whole discussion, how much that plays into what you're doing. The second, um, ironically, yesterday I had a conversation with our um, um, senior social worker behavioral health specialist who's uh, from public health at National Guard Bureau. And we were talking about this. And for him, also my same faith, but didn't really, you know, sort of grew up originally, but now, you know, his religion is science. And his faith is science. and. This is nice. I mean, I struggle with that because I'm, I'm, I'm into what you're teaching and doing. But when this is played to a social, to a, to a straight psychological mental health perspective, we're not getting this. And I'm, I'm thinking very clearly when I sat in one of his phone conversations with a couple of people out of uh, um, 
uh, Department of uh, Mental Health or stuff out of Walter Reed, everything was psychological. And I didn't even join in because if I brought in spiritual, I felt like they weren't going to listen to me. Where what you're bringing brings a whole different perspective. So that's a huge part. And uh, one last thing to throw out from my tradition, I'll thank you very much of uh, um, one of the great rabbis, Hillel, said, if I am not for myself, who will be for me? If I'm only for myself, what am I, if not now, when? A lot of what I think you're bringing brings that to this identity. So thank you. Yeah, thank you, Dr. thank Moore, you. I'm gonna interrupt just for a second. Sure. Um, apologize, but Dr. McGordy's ready in two minutes. Two minutes, okay. So, um, Chaplain uh, Sergeant Wesley's gonna pass out uh, AARs so that you can write it, write on them as you go through these, uh, as you go through the day instead of trying to remember for, okay. so we'll do that while you're answering the question. Super, um, thank you. So, um, I have been working the Spirituality Mind Body Institute at Columbia, or the Institute, that we founded, um, has been working with the Department of Health and Human Services, and in particular, the Office of Faith-Based Initiatives and Opportunities, on exactly that point, which is given the epidemic rates of depression and suicidality and addiction, given what we face as a country, in light of this very strong and persuasive science that we need spiritual support for our patients, spiritual support and formation of young people. How, does, how is this implemented? And the model that seems to have the most traction is the model for which it seems the Army is already built to go, which is a partnership. That for every patient, there is a standard behavioral health provider, like the colleague you just mentioned, and they are given the choice, the proactively stated you know, not, oh, you know, go find it, but they are given actively a choice to see the chaplain because what the data says is that I need both. I absolutely need both. Um, actually, what the data says is I actually need this more two-thirds of the time, but at least the data says I need both. Um, and the partnership model is attractive because the colleague that you describe who's a social worker, although I don't know him per se, the data on mental health providers is that most mental health providers feel that for, they are aware that their clients are often more religious and more spiritually oriented than they are. And they are also aware that they may not particularly have um, a sense of what that is or have been trained in how to be helpful. And don't, the data says most mental health providers do not feel prepared to address spiritual concerns. So if, as a mental health provider, I know you are prepared and that you see your place there and you've explained to me how we can work side by side in partnership in our two lanes, that seems to me like an enormous opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. If not now, when? I agree. Now is the time. And the hunger and the need and the awareness of the need of spiritual support is very strong right now in our country. Other thoughts? Okay, I'm going to explain to you. So I, as you know, um, have worked very closely with my extraordinary colleagues in planning this event. Um, I'm the lead scientist in planning the next two days together with the uh, US Army chaplaincy together for 18 months, two years. The people you're gonna see, um, we've worked together to design a program of, of study where you're going to see different experts who have in advance planned how our talks will interface. The next person you're gonna see is the Associate Dean at the Business School at Columbia, Jack McGurdy, a very dear colleague. His work for many years has been working with clergy on translation of science to programmatic innovation, using science, seeing opportunity to expand the reach and augment